Welcome to the Photoethics Podcast. I'm your host, Savannah Dodd, and I'm the founder of the Photography Ethics Center. Each week, I'll be talking with an accomplished photographer about the ethics of their practice. Today, in episode number three, we'll be talking with Danielle Viasana about representation and equity. Danielle Viasana is an independent photojournalist based in Istanbul, whose documentary work focuses on human rights, gender, health, and migration. She's a National Geographic Explorer, a Magnum Foundation awardee, an Eddie Adams Workshop alumna, and an International Women's Media Foundation Fellow. Her work has been included in solo and group exhibitions and has been published in the New York Times, National Geographic, and the Washington Post, among others. Her first photo book, A Light Inside, was published in 2018 by Photo Evidence. Danielle's strong belief in the power of photography paired with education and community development has guided her involvement in various initiatives and organizations. She's a co-founder of We Women, a community team member of the Everyday Projects, a board member of the Authority Collective, a member of Women Photograph and Ayun Photographas, and a co-author of the Photo Bill of Rights. I was wondering if you could maybe first talk, um, tell me a little bit about the type of work that you do or what, what your work in photography looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, I am an independent photojournalist and I primarily focus on issues around the world pertaining to human rights, migration, identity, and health. I am based in Istanbul, but I'm originally from the United States, and I am very involved in a lot of group organizations within the photo industry. I'm on the community team of the Everyday Projects. I'm a board member of the Authority Collective. I'm a member of Women Photograph and Diversify Photo. And since I started my career as an independent photojournalist in 2014, that's been a, a really big primary goal of mine is to foster community and uplift one another and support one another and especially people who are from marginalized communities and so that's just been part of my practice ever since I I started off in in the industry and it's it's really enriching to see these changes happening because even though I started about six years ago there's been visible change. I mean, of course, there's still a tremendous amount of work to do, and the work is endless. There's never going to be a point where we reach and say, okay, we're perfect now, like everything is good, everything is golden. Um, it's going to take a lot of work from individuals, from organizations, and all of us working collectively together. So I really believe in in collective organization and um, and sort of fighting these industry issues together. Absolutely. I think that makes so much sense. And, you know, like, I think you're completely right. What you say about when it's never, it's never going to be solved. Like we're never, it's never going to be done. It's a constant process. And I think, um, I think it's really important. Yeah. That the different organizations come together and try to address them together because there's definitely strength in numbers. And I think many organizations are, are working toward, towards sort of very similar, the same goals and, um, mm -hmm. there's, there's so much to be done. And, um, I guess I, I'm curious, could you talk maybe a little bit about, I think the photography industry is often viewed as something that's very competitive and you talk a lot about uplifting people and supporting other photographers and working together in collaboration. And so I guess I was just wondering what is your view on that or how do you respond to that when people sort of feel that there's a very strong competitive element to the industry? I believe that there is enough work for everyone and that our creativity and capabilities to tell stories is endless and competing against one another and tearing each other down and withholding resources and information is just making the industry worse. I mean, when, when, when individuals are thriving, everyone is thriving and it's the same sort of thing. Like just because someone is given more rights, doesn't mean that you're having your rights taken away. That's not how equality works. And I believe that it's the same within our industry and 
it, yeah, it just, it just make, it creates a more robust community when, when information is being shared as opposed to hoarding that information to yourself. I mean, even for not the best example, but even with respect to financial issues, um, if, you know, it's better to have a conversation about rates that are acceptable so that a photographer then knows what to quote a client as opposed to under quoting or over quoting. Um, you know, oftentimes we see that uh, white men are paid way much more for the work that they do, not only in the photojournalism industry, but across the board, across society, across many, many different industries. And that is a result of people not sharing information. And so I believe the more that we uplift each other, the more space we create for one another and the more rich our industry is, the richer our storytelling is. And that's really important because ultimately this is about truth telling. This is directly linked to how people view the world. And when we are denying those voices into that dialogue, we're basically failing society. So I believe that our industry can only be better by creating community and fostering community and making space for one another. It will continue to be problematic if that doesn't happen. Absolutely. No, I think that that was really, really well put. Um, and that makes the, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's really useful for people to hear as well. Um, I guess sort of this idea of knowledge sharing and, um, uplifting one another, I guess, would be quite central. Would you view that very much as part of the ethics of your practice? Like, does that, is that, is there an ethical imperative in that? Is that how you view it? For sure. I think it's about being a decent human being. Uh, I mean, it's really not, it's not that difficult, you know, I mean, look at the pandemic, for example, like, you know, and, and I can say this because I'm from the United States, but I'm living in Turkey and in Turkey, um, there haven't been as many issues with access to hand sanitizer and face mask. I mean, certainly there were periods during the pandemic where they were hard to find or they were scarce, but not in the same way in the United States. And, and, and why didn't people have access to that? Because people were hoarding that. And something someone said to me that really resonated was in a pandemic, you want that other person to have access to soap and a face mask because their health depends on like your health depends on their health. And that's how I feel about the industry too. It's just about, it's almost like karma. For example, if you are putting good energy out into the universe and you are uplifting someone and you're sharing their, your contacts with them, that's going to come back to you. Maybe not from that person, but they're going to remember you. And maybe if they're talking to an editor and the editor's like, Oh, I'm looking for someone in this place. They might be like, Oh yeah. You know, so-and-so is in that place. And it's just, mm -hmm. again, there's so much work. There's so many opportunities for everyone, but yet we continuously see the same type of people get those opportunities and it creates a sort of vicious cycle and a snowball effect. And we really need to break that rhythm and that pattern. And yeah. So I just think it's about, you know, why be selfish? It's so much more enriching to give and receive and equally and make friendships. I mean, I love photojournalism as my profession, but also my passion. And if I approached photojournalism in a competitive way where I felt, you know, everybody is against me and every man for himself, it would be a miserable experience. Part of the joy that I get out of photojournalism is that sharing and being together, not only with my colleagues, but also with people in the community. And consent sort of falls into that. When you see someone that you're photographing as just someone in your frame and you're in and out and you're there and you're taking and you know, you're never going to see that person again. 
suddenly consent probably doesn't really feel that important to you because you haven't made that relationship. You haven't connected with that person in a real, honest, human way. But if you do that, then suddenly, very likely, getting that person's consent and informed consent and them understanding exactly where their image might end up and the potential implications that that could cause is going to be a lot easier because you see that individual as another person just like you on the same level as you. And so, yeah, I think it, it all goes hand in hand. It's just really simply about being a good person. I really don't think it's that difficult. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's the, that makes a lot of sense. And absolutely, like, I, I think that there's something really beautiful in what you're saying about, um, you know, there's, I think that there's a lot of talk, I guess, in a lot of different spheres about like, you know, respect for subjects and respect for like the people that we're working with and the people we're photographing. And, but I feel like it's not always talked about as being equally important to have respect for our colleagues and respect for, you know, other people that we're working with. And like, what is our responsibility to somebody if you're working with a, a translator or, um, a writer or a fixer, you know, there, there's all these other elements, I think that kind of get left out of the relationships. Like you said, you're talking a lot about relationships and I feel like there's so many relationships we deal with, um, as photographers or photojournalists that they're not always sort of unpacked in the same, with the same care, if that makes mm -hmm. any sense. Yeah, that's a really good uh, point. And it just makes me think of hierarchy, when there's hierarchy of power based on this notion that you're better than someone else because you're a photographer, you've won five awards and that person is just starting off. I mean, that is mm -hmm. something that I just detest in the photojournalism industry. This, this idea that recognition is so important and that you have to have all these awards under your belt to be considered worthy of storytelling and that same philosophy then is going to translate into the work that you do in the community. And so if we can get rid of that hierarchy of power, which is linked to equity and inclusivity, then again, I believe our industry would work a lot better and the media would be more wholesome and more ethical. And then that ultimately is going to translate into a more wholesome and ethical world. So it's all linked together. I guess I was wondering if you could talk um, a little bit about the role of photo editors, because something that I think people, and, and, and I guess people commissioning photography more, more broadly, um, because a lot of times when I'm talking about ethical issues, like spending time, you know, how getting consent, getting informed consent often takes more time. I think a lot of the times people will come back and say, well, like talk to the photo editors or talk to the, you know, the, the people who are paying me to be here because I don't have that time. I'm not given that time. Like that's not, it's not within their capacity. So I guess I'm wondering, um, what's the responsibility for the photo editors and then what's, what, what can, photojournalists themselves do practically that isn't sort of reliant on, on uh, the powers of be? That's a really good question. I think, again, in order for our industry to progress, everyone, not everyone, I mean, we don't all have to be on the same page, but I think that there definitely needs to be a shift in the way that we operate now. And with respect to consent, I definitely believe that it should also be something that's important to an editor and not only the editor, but the publication. We've seen countless examples in the past where consent was not clear and there have been issues that have come up because of that. And as a result, it diminishes the public's trust in the media and in, and in that publication. So again, this all goes back to, I mean, it's not just about being a good human being, it's also about protecting the media as a source of truth. So everybody should be invested in bettering the industry um, through inclusivity and equity and consent is one of the many, many, many things that we could do to improve. And that has always been 
that is an evergreen issue in the in the media industry is that things happen so fast and news is so fast paced and it's even more so now with social media that oftentimes there is very little time and mm-hmm. it is a valid argument but i believe that when something is desired we make room for those things to be achieved and i believe that it's the same with consent so if we were to prioritize that, I believe that we would come up with the tools to make it happen. And I've worked in situations such as, um, you know, periphery of conflict zones or communities that have been affected by conflict or violence. I photographed uh, people in uh, the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. I was there with an NGO. I have photographed in many, many scenarios that aren't just a protest or a portrait session. And I can say that consent is informed verbal and even written consent is 100% possible. It's not 100% possible in every situation. Of course, if you are, for example, photographing an area where there's just hundreds and hundreds of people, of course you can't get consent from all of those hundreds of people. But if you're focusing on a couple of individuals within that group of 100 people, you can certainly get consent, whether it's verbal, if you don't speak the language, you can sort of gesture with body language, like, you know, "Mm, is it okay? Like, you know, show your camera and like, can I, you know, there's ways that you can use your body language if you don't speak the language. And the same goes in the opposite direction. If someone is waving their arm or they have a disgruntled look on their face or they're telling you no or waving their hand or turning away really quickly, which I'm sure we have all experienced when we're working, then that is a very clear indication that that person doesn't want you to photograph them. And you should respect that. And you should walk away because you know what, in that crowd of a hundred people, I'm sure there is someone who is going to be fine with you being there. Yes. So it takes a little bit of extra work. It takes a little bit of extra time, but we, that's, the bare minimum of what we should give to people because they have given us the opportunity to photograph them in oftentimes very sensitive and vulnerable situations, which by the way, can sometimes have really negative consequences and effects. So it is our duty. It is a very basic duty to have those conversations as much as possible. Again, there are definitely situations where it's not possible, but as much as you can, keep those questions of consent in your mind and at the forefront of your practice. Um, Just like anything else we do in our practice, you know, the way we caption our photos and I mean, keywording, God, that takes so much time, but yet we make time for it. I don't, I think it's really frivolous, but you know, I mean, we make time for things, but the thing is, is I could make the time so we can always make the time. I think also when you stop and have a conversation with someone it's going to lead you to more intimate storytelling and that's going to lead you to situations and scenarios that probably, you know, those 50 photographers who stayed to photograph that one big moment don't have. And again, it's, it's not an issue of, Oh, well I got this shot that they don't have. No, it's about showing the complete story. And so when we stop to have those conversations and those intimate conversations, that's going to tell a different part of the story that's just as important as that other part. But yet the media relies so heavily on the sort of stereotypical, quick images that are fast to make for all of those reasons that we've already talked about. So, um, and a really quick note on informed consent. I think consent also, as much as possible, if you have the time, to really explain what consent means. You you know, it's not enough to just say, hey, can I take your photograph? Especially when that person is potentially in a vulnerable situation or they're from a marginalized community. If you're like taking pictures of, you know, somebody selling watches on the street and you just want to put it on your Instagram, maybe you say, hey, can I take a picture and I'm going to put it on my Instagram account? And maybe that's enough. But if you are photographing people and 
sensitive situations, then it's really, really important to explain all of the possible ramifications and details of what it means to say yes. And, and then, I mean, for me personally, then I feel like I can sleep at night. I mean, it, it's, I never want to feel like I've, you know, taken a photograph of someone and they had no idea where it was going to end up. I mean, that to me feels like taking advantage of someone. So again, as much as possible, just repeating for the 50th time, there are situations where it's not going to be possible, but you know, making it part of your practice, I think is really important. Absolutely. And I, I think the whole idea of of consent that isn't informed kind of, kind of kills me because it's like, it's not actually consent if you don't know what you're consenting to, you know, like, exactly. I don't know. I always use the example in the case of uh, international development, you know, consenting to have your photograph in an annual report is very different from consenting to have your photograph on a billboard, you know, and, and yet exactly. these things are not always outlined in that way at all. My release forms, which I try to get even in public, settings when I'm photographing sensitive situations are really detailed. (laughs) Like it says, you know, your photograph may end up on social media. I think I might even say billboard, you know, in a museum in an exhibit, because the thing is, is as photographers, especially independent photographers, we take photographs and those photographs live on our hard drives. I mean, I get requests for photos to this day that I took four years ago, five years ago. And so, and maybe it's for something that is completely different than the original intent, Mm -hmm. but that person understands that they're picture could end up anywhere. Like I am here for this publication and it's going to end up in print and online and on social media for this one particular publication. But I want you to understand that additionally, I'm not sure if it could happen now, but there might be a time in the future where your photo could end up on blah, 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 blah. And I, I totally outline it on my authorization forms. I try to have a very robust conversation about what it means. And only then does the person say yes, or do they sign the author, you know, release form or whatever, because I, again, it personally helps me sleep better. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. I, I was recently involved in helping a university that was doing a photography based research project. I helped them design a consent form for it. And the, the way that I sort of tried to approach that is with the idea of maybe making it multi-layered consent so that people can say like, yes, I'm fine with everything, except I really don't want to be on Facebook. Maybe it's like this one specific thing, which isn't practical in all situations or in everyday practice. But I guess for the context of this one project, it was manageable to say, oh, this person doesn't want this context, you know? And I think it just gives people a little bit more sense of a little bit greater sense of ownership or of control over how their image is used to just even have the option to say, you know, there's one thing that I really don't want, you know? Totally. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have a little like addendum spot on the release form where if anybody wants to say whatever they want, um, then, then they can include that there. And, you know, as you were saying that it sort of made me think about the logistics of implementing those desires and, you know, potential sort of excuse or rebuttal for that could be, well, like, you know, a photo may live in an archive, you know, on X wire. And, you know, 10 years from now, there may be a different editor who didn't assign that particular photographer to photograph that situation who knew that back information. Well, if we can include information about embargoes and all of that stuff and the metadata of the photo, we can also include that information about consent. So again, absolutely. If it's Absolutely. something that we want and something that we prioritize, we can make it happen. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's a really good point because I have heard that a lot. So I think it's made me a wee bit gun, gun shy about, about suggesting it because everybody's like, well, how do you implement mm-hmm. that? You know, <laughs> so mm-hmm. no, that's a really good point. Something that I've thought a lot about, um, but haven't really figured out where I personally stand on it um, and what even is a practicable response to this, but I, I do wonder a lot about like viewer responsibility. Do you think that like, like what is our responsibility as viewers of media? Um, because it's, it's sort of like that, that chain effect, isn't it? That like, 
a lot of times, you know, people might say that we don't have enough time and, um, you know, the type of images that get chosen can often be the shocking images and the newspapers will say, well, that's, that's what people want, you know? So it's sort of like, if you go along the chain of, uh, demand, Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, what, what responsibility do you think that maybe viewers might have in this ecosystem of media consumption? That's a really tough question to answer because it goes back to that question of what came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, and while it's, it's, it's tough because I believe that the issues that we're seeing in our world now are related to how the media has portrayed our world. And so it's a very odd cycle and system that sort of feeds off of one another. And it's hard to know what the origin is or how to stop it. But one thing I really do believe is that if we can diversify our storytelling, not only in terms of more inclusivity for Uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, but also the types of stories that we're telling. So not always the stereotypical facet of an issue. The onus of that responsibility does fall on the media industry. While individuals, I think, should educate themselves about issues, for example, anti-racism, um or the global south or you know whatever ethical issues that we see in our world today i mean people as individuals really need to educate themselves it's not just about you know journalists producing these materials and nobody's reading them or nobody's you know i mean that work it's it's a it's a two-way street but again i do believe that the responsibility lies on the media industry, because that is, there's a lot of power in the media industry. There's a lot of power in the way that we make stories and portray our world. And not only in photojournalism, but in, you know, cinema and music. And I believe that there is a desire for viewers to see something different. Uh, That's a huge reason why the Everyday Projects was so successful, Um, You know, it started with Everyday Africa and people were just so ready to see something different uh, from Africa that wasn't the same tropes and stereotypes that we see over and over and over again that is so, like, (sighs) problematic. And honestly, it's not telling the whole story. And, you know, the Everyday Projects sort of kickstarted a huge global movement. Their everyday accounts in Moldova, in Latin America, in Uruguay, in uh, India. I mean, they're everywhere because people are so tired of seeing those same narratives. So I do believe that there, there already is a desire for different stories to be told. And I believe that the issues that we're seeing right now, specifically in the United States with protesters feeling vulnerable when it comes to having their photograph taken also lies in the fact that journalists have been irresponsible with the types of stories that they've told of communities that are marginalized. And we should also take that into consideration as journalists that we created this problem actually, and it is our responsibility to fix it. For sure. Like, I feel like something that you said earlier was about um, the integrity of of the journalism industry as a whole. And I think, you know, it's not only in terms of, yeah, with maintaining integrity with the viewers, but also, yeah, maintaining t- integrity with the people that we work with. Like, I come from a background in anthropology, and that's something that we talk a lot about in anthropology is there's so many communities that have been burned by anthropologists, and they don't want to talk to anthropologists anymore, you know? And that's what will happen, <laughs> you know, to to the journalism industry, too. If people are burned by it, we're not going to have anybody who will give consent or who wants to be involved anymore, um, or who wants Absolutely. to have their story told by journalists. So. Yeah, absolutely. And you hear that a lot, too, even as journalists, right? You, you know, you hear people say, well, you know, I talked to this one journalist and, you know, whatever happened. um, And 
So I don't really feel like I want to talk to you or, you know, I mean, you hear that all the time that people, and that also, that also links to the issue with people parachuting into communities that are not their own because they feel that they're going to leave. They can get on a flight and go home and they may never go back to that community again. And so it doesn't matter because then it doesn't affect them. And that also links to the reason why if we have a more communal sort of approach to this industry and we realize that our actions affect first and foremost, not only the community itself, but also our colleagues who may come after us, not to mention the local journalists or fixers or drivers who also remain in that community and help to produce that work and could potentially receive harmful consequences as a result, you would act better. So all of these things, again, are just so interwoven and, and, and linked together. For sure. I do want to ask you a couple questions about uh, Authority Collective's do no harm statement on photographing the police brutality protests. And I definitely don't want to ask you to like rehash the whole thing because uh, it's there and everybody should go read it. But I guess I had one sort of specific question. I was wondering a little bit about, you know, in the statement, um, Authority Collective wrote about the risk of decontextualizing the unrest by showing the protests without the police brutality that preceded them. And I guess I was wondering a little bit how, what's a responsible way to use visual evidence of police brutality without desensitizing white viewers toward black suffering and without re-traumatizing black viewers? Big question, sorry. No, that's a really important question. And I think it just goes back to telling the whole story. A lot of these publications that are running stories about the protests happening right now, they're running galleries. They're not just running one picture. I mean, sure, maybe one photograph goes, you know, on A1 above the fold. And in that case, I would say try to pick a picture that tells the entire story, which, of course, is difficult. But in a gallery of 15 images, you can include all of those elements and you can sequence those photographs in a way that reduce trauma. And you can put something on top of the photo that allows the viewer to say, click to see photo if they want to see that photo. There are many ways that we can reduce harm. I really believe strongly in telling the full story, which oftentimes does mean photographing situations that are difficult to look at. But that image has to be paired with the other element to the story, which could just be an intimate moment of two people hugging each other at a protest or that person who's handing out water bottles or, you know, the discarded signs near the trash can or someone walking home in the light with their child holding their hand. You have to tell the complete story because when we only tell little fragments and elements of the story, we're not doing our duty as journalists because we're only giving viewers that one slice of the truth. I think that there are ways to photograph police brutality or black suffering in a way that isn't so sensationalistic. So there are ways to even tell that part of the story that is difficult to see and that could and oftentimes does re-traumatize people, there are ways to photograph that in such a way that doesn't do that. About context, this is one moment in time that we're seeing. And this is not a unique moment in time. This is a moment in time that comes from an incredibly long history of violence against Black communities. And if the media would have made greater effort in the past to also focus on the positive stories that come from Black communities, that would also help provide context. So it also goes back into how we have told stories in the past and how we think about telling stories in the future. Um, there's a really great, great quote that I would love to share with you um, by Shiam Galyon. She's not a photographer, but she's a social justice activist and she's very 
learn it about these issues in the media. Okay, she says, I want to live in a world that feels moved by photos of non-white people at their best moments in life rather than at their worst. And if we look at the history of the media, that's all we have done is told, tell stories of people at their worst and eliminated for the most part, white people from that pain and suffering um, by focusing on you know, marginalized communities as the ones who are the victims and the perpetrators and everything as opposed to telling the stories of people from marginalized communities also at their best. So that also needs to change. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Photo Ethics Podcast. The aim of this podcast is to share new insights about photography ethics with others. So if you heard something you liked, please share this podcast with someone who would appreciate it. The links to all things mentioned in this episode number three are available in the show notes at www.photoethics.org. Join me next week when we hear from Polly Braden about negotiating consent. Consent.